Hallelujah. I want to welcome you into the 11th hour today. Officially welcome you in. This is a great time to be here. It's a great time. It's a great time to declare the truth. Amen. The truth you know will make you free. So we have to declare the truth and make it known to people. Now, the enemy don't like the truth, and so he seeks to squelch it at every turn. <clears throat> and if he can't stop it, he seeks to dilute it. Makes no difference. Just get the truth to where it's not heard in its right context. <clears throat> now, I want you to go over to St. John chapter 18, and we're going to put up, uh, well, we'll just look at St. John 18. Well, let's see what's, what verses I want to go to. Amen. It's good to have everybody from around the world and all over this great nation of ours. And uh, if there's anybody watching in Israel, I'd like to know today. Maybe you could chat in and let us know you're watching in Israel. Amen. That would be a great thing to know. Now, <clears throat> Okay, we'll just start in verse 1. That way we get plenty of word in us today. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook uh, Kidron, where was a garden into that which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oftentimes resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Isn't it amazing that always, always the attack against the truth comes from the religious circles? It always starts there. You know, you would think after a while people would locate themselves in Scripture, and you're either going to locate yourselves in one form or fashion. If you're attacking ministers and you're attacking this, you're in this band right here because that's who came after Jesus. You know, I'll tell you something that's really amazing to me is that, and this is not part of the message, but maybe it is, that you, uh, people, you know, they, they attack, say, this ministry. They'll attack us and, and, you know, verbally attack us in all kinds of ways. And it's amazing to me that these are religious people, a lot of them, and some of them just, you know, they're in ministry, but they will attack us. And, of course, we don't attack back, but they'll attack us and, or attack me. And, and it's, you know, it's always over something uh, trivial and uh, because it's hard. You know, I, I use a lot of words, so that's kind of tough. And, but the thing is, is that, that they, they will uh, attack us. But here's the deal. Witches attack us, too. Isn't it amazing? You know something is amiss and something's wrong when religious leaders side with witches. You know, either the witches are right or they're right. Now, we, you know, if they're attacking us, why are you attacking us? And if, if we're supposed to be so wrong, then why are witches attacking us and the occultic world? Why would they attack us if we were on their side? But religion finds itself siding with witches and warlocks just like Saul went to the witch of Endor. <clears throat> now, I want you to, let's finish this now uh, and read some of this. Judas then, having received a band of men, verse 3 again, we'll look at, and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek you? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. Isn't it amazing, man? That's amazing that religious leaders and religious people stand with corrupt government. That's amazing things. Coming to, over, to hand Jesus over to government, the very government they didn't like. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell on the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let, those go, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake of them, which thou gavest me, uh, 
have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into thy sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band of captains, uh, then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now, I want you to notice this. He, well, they had one reason, you know. In verse 14, now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. So you see what their motive was. But I want you to see this, that the Lord, I was, I was uh, he impressed me with this that this was the day, this was the day the truth was bound. It was the day they bound the truth. Now, I want you to think about that, the day they bound the truth. The truth was diluted in Adam's garden, but it was bound. It was bound and led away in the garden of Gethsemane. The day the truth was bound and led away, the truth entered the greatest battle it would ever fight. And it existed in human form, Jesus the Christ. If it could be killed and be handed over to the kingdom of lies, then it could be uh, silenced forever and the whole world would be trapped in a lie. Now, if you look over at verse 38, Pilate asked this, he said, what is truth? And truth was standing right in front of him the whole time. And he said, what is truth? And it was standing right there. The crowd screamed, crucify him. Why? They were wrong about sin. He had said that earlier. They're wrong about sin. They're wrong about righteousness. And they're wrong about judgment. So the truth is, had been bound and the truth is always the thing that, that the enemy seeks to bind because you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. So that, this was the day the truth was bound. We'd never seen a day like that. In Adam's garden, it was just diluted, but in Jesus' garden, they bound it. They bound it and Jesus stood before uh, the so-called high priest and, and all that, that day, that night. And when he did, they asked him a question, he answered it, and a soldier smote him with the palm of his hand. And Jesus said, if I've told a lie, he said, bear witness of it. But if I'm telling the truth, why are you hitting me? Because the, the kingdom of lies was seeking to shut the mouth of the kingdom of the truth. It has to shut it. It has to keep truth buried. It has to kill it any way it can so that it can be rewritten in a lie. See, go over to Romans chapter 1. I want you to see that for just a moment. We live in a time where the truth has been bound, and men really think that they can overcome this. They tried to seal the truth in a tomb. They tried to take and put a government seal. Think about that. The government sealed the truth in a tomb so that it couldn't know anything. Nobody could ever hear the truth again. But the truth can't be bound. It can't stay bound. You could, you could bury it. They, they killed it. They buried it. They sealed it with all the power the government had. And yet when it did, after three days and nights, the ground started rumbling because the truth was coming out. The stone was going to be rolled away. And the angel assigned to the truth came there and rolled the stone away. And God fights for the truth. Now, Romans chapter 1, we get over there, and I don't know if I want to read all of it, but we, we'll see. Let me look at it. Hallelujah. I'm glad everybody's here today, uh, tuned in today. Now, in Romans chapter 1, I want us to go down to, uh, oh, let's see. Let's go down to. 
verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew not God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the, incor of the uncorruptible God into the image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie. We live in a time when they're seeking to keep the truth bound. The truth was loosed after three days and nights, and it lives in the hearts of every believer. But here you see still, you see government today trying to bind the truth. Organizations organized to do nothing but bind the truth. It's all to hide the truth. The truth you know will make you free who changed the truth of the gospel into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their, in their lust one toward uh, another, toward uh, another, one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly. That word unseemly not only means a shame and so forth, but one of the meanings is, is a woman's genitals. And it said the men turn themselves to women's genitals. In other words, they begin to change their bodies. They begin to do this. It was told from the days of old that this is what happens when the truth is hid. When you try to make the truth a lie. And people would like for me to shut up, but I won't shut up. I'm not going to shut up. You can forget it. You take you a CO2, uh, what do you call it, a fire extinguisher that blows ice cold, and you go freeze hell over, and I'll skate across it and tell the truth. We're not talking, I'm not stopping to, to, to tell the truth. Why? There are, there are, this is the time we're in, and there are men, and there are women, and they've organized, people have organized, listen, I'm going to tell you something. They've organized groups to hold them prisoners in their minds. The, the prison in the mind is stronger than any bar you could forge in fire. It traps somebody in their thinking. And I'm going to tell you something. They're rewriting language. See, it's all language. Here's something you may not know. This would be something interesting to you. I was doing some studying not long ago, and now computers, you know, I was watching this one thing where, where a, a, a man, they, they showed a, an image of a man looking at a picture of a giraffe. Then they took a computer and hooked it up to the man's head, to read the blood flow in his brain and wouldn't let the computer see the image of the giraffe. So they asked the computer to say, to tell, draw a picture of what the man's looking at and monitoring the blood flow in the brain. It drew a picture of a giraffe. It drew a picture of a giraffe. So now what, what is all of this? Where you're looking at, this is what they said, all computer now, everything you deal with is just language to a computer. And they listed things that could be edited by the computer. And one was your DNA because it's just language. Everything is language to a computer. And it can edit anything that's language. And so there, you're looking at things you've never seen before and dangerous places that men are trying to go beyond God. And you've got, You've got false prophets like Noah Harari speaking out 
talking about how we're going beyond the God of the Hebrew Bible. Well, can you see what they're trying to do? They can edit DNA. They can edit words, just like, just like words. They can edit pictures. They can edit anything to a computer is simply language. So if they want to hold men and women captive and begin to turn a lie, the truth into a lie, like listed here, like we're, we're you know, somebody looks up and says, uh, I, was, I was born, I was really a woman trapped in my body. No, no, the chromosomes in your blood will prove you're a man. It doesn't make any difference, but it says that, that he turned them over to vile affections to work that which is unseemly, to even change the genitals of somebody. But that don't make you that race or, or that, that sex. It makes you just, and one of the words listed in here is deformed. That's all. They've lied to you. They've lied to you, and they use language to entrap you. They're changing language, changing pronouns, changing all kinds of language, letters, LGBTQ, whatever else, and it's all just letters and language, and it's all, if it, because if it can be put into a language, it can be edited in your life. And so I'm not going to shut up because there's precious people over there within those prisons that I'm trying my best to reach in and get and pull back out and show them that God has a life and a destiny that they've never seen before and they don't have to let a bunch of letters define who they are. Let the words of the living God define who you are and reveal your destiny to you. And so spiritually... You see these letters around people have become like gates of hell. They become gates that have to be broken through. And so we reach over and, and start trying to reveal to people, look, this is your destiny. When Jesus approached the madman of Gadara, and he came up to the madman of Gadara, the scripture said he had an unclean spirit, had an unclean spirit, and he lived nude in the tombs. Have you ever seen LGBTQ parades? Tell me that don't describe that. Would you let your children stand out and watch two men uh, uh, have sex the way they do? If I describe the act, you'd, some of you would throw up. And would you let your children watch that? If you do, you're the one needs help, not them. We have to see through a lie. We have to see the truth on the other side. The Bible's very plain about these things. But the Bible's also very plain about the people that's trapped in it that he loves more than anything. Because he, he braved, did you know he braved a storm to go after those people? He braved a killing storm, a life-threatening storm. He knew what he was, he was doing. He knew he only did what he heard his fa uh, saw his father do and only said what he heard his father say. And he said, let's go over to the other side. Why? There's a man over there crying, chained up in those tombs, and all they know how to do is try to bind him more and more, made him a freakish sideshow so that all that area was famous for this man who was trapped. But this man was crying night and day for someone to come and help him. And Jesus said, let us go to the other side. The father told his son, Jesus, go over there and deliver this man. So he gets in the boat and heads over there. And these demons, all 2,000 of them, kicked up this storm on, on the Galilee. And it was so fierce that those fishermen who had fished there their whole lives said, we're going to die. This thing is enough to kill us all. Jesus rebuked the winds and waves. He did everything he did to get to that man. And when he got to the man, my friends, listen what he said to him. He said, what is your name? He wasn't asking the demon what his name was. I'm convinced he wasn't. He said, what is your name? He's looking. He's looking. Hallelujah. It may have had something to do with speaking to that spirit to identify him in some form or fashion, whatever it may have been. But I know he was talking to the man also. 
Listen to this. I want to see if I can find this. In Mark chapter 5, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. No man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and and had been plucked asunder by him, and the uh, fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Think about that. Think about that. And he says this, and when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him. Shows you what he was crying for, deliverance. And he cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I command thee, or I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he had said, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered, my name is Legion, for we are many. He asked him. The man couldn't even answer his own identity. He couldn't say who he was. The spirit had taken his identity, and he had made the man Legion. He had made that man his own name. But Jesus wants you to see that you have an identity that don't include these spirits. And you're fighting and struggling to break the chains and get yourself free. And every time you think you've got a little bit free, they come and bind you right back down again. But the Lord wants you free. He's not just speaking to that spirit. He's wanting the man's identity to come forward also. Hallelujah. So today, we're calling over into that with the truth. Let's see now. Let's go on with Romans and see what we have here. We'll put that back up. Romans chapter 1 is where we were. And I want you to listen to this. So he gets here and he says, And likewise also, verse 27, The men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which were not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So, in other words, they're bringing death to themselves. They're drawing it to themselves. And did you notice some of these people know what they're doing? See, I want to tell you this. I understand how young people, the youth and children, can have their minds so changed that they could look in a mirror and see their body parts and still believe they're another uh, sex of people. But there's people over them. There's grown people who know exactly what they're doing. They know what they're doing. They didn't have some of them in politics wearing wigs and makeup and sitting there saying, we don't know what a woman, the definition of a woman is, and we don't know this, and we don't know that. These people know what they're doing, and they're actually on purpose leading a young generation their direction. We have to reach out to reach these people. The only way you're going to do it is tell them their identity, that Jesus has come to set them free. He's come to set them free. All the ways you've tried to get free, all the ways you've tried to cut yourself to feel pain, that ought to tell you right there when people cut themselves just to feel some pain, they are numb, that demons have absolutely came to destroy them. I want you to think of that. So we come out with the truth. The truth has been bound in these days. It's been bound and it's been given over to a lie. It's been given to a lie. And they don't know what sin is anymore. 
And they don't know what judgment is anymore. They don't know what righteousness is anymore. It's all been twisted and turned. And sin is not sin anymore. They just say love is love. They don't even mention sin. Sin don't exist unless it exists to you. This is the downfall of every civilization. It's the downfall of every group of men and women. It's the downfall of any nation is when it gets this corrupt. We have to stand for the truth. But it's the truth you know that will make you free. And that's what people are, they get so mad at me about because I'll tell the truth. And if you're a, if you're a religious leader and you're a, a pastor or a, a prophet or evangelist or teacher, if you're an apostle, if you're in the five-fold ministry and you find yourself attacking me or somebody else that's speaking truth, then you do know that the witches and warlocks attack us too. So you're siding with them. One of you are wrong. Don't you see that? It's because the truth has been redefined. It, it's a lie has been told as the truth, and the truth has been told as a lie. But in this generation, the truth is being unloosed now. In this prophetic generation, this is a prophetic generation. This is why the enemy tries to destroy the prophetic and the prophets because this is the generation. The scripture said when Elijah went to Zarephath to the widow and she made him the cake and made him the cru with the cruise of oil and the, and the meal didn't run dry and the cruise of oil never ran dry. It was always replenished. She, her son was there and her son died. And she said, it's because of my past sin. You're bringing up my past sin to me. He said, give me the boy. She handed the boy to the prophet. The prophet carried him up into his chamber. He stretched himself on the boy. He would walk and pray. Then he'd do it again. And he prayed. And the boy woke up. And it said it was in a time when the breath was taken away from a, from a generation, from the boy. It's prophetic to this time. When the earth was infected with a virus, it was a virus of the mind as much as it was the body. It was a virus to convince you that you couldn't go from your house to your mailbox or you may die. It was a virus put in a mind to trap everyone so they couldn't move, they couldn't think, they couldn't talk, they couldn't pray. And they couldn't go to the church for help because they shut them down. And the church locked their doors. And the churches that were open and that were allowed to open, they could only hold a fraction of the people and had to take the temperatures of the sick before they could come in the door. There was no power, no anointing, nothing. The truth had been made a lie, and a lie had been called the truth. And so it infected the minds of the people. It infected a generation. It took their breath away. It took their will to live away. And it said in that day, in that day when that widow's son died, said he said, give me the boy. He stretched himself on the boy eye to eye, mouth to mouth. And when he did, it said the boy revived. There was a revival. Elijah was sent to two generations of people, the mother and the son. The mother, the older generation, was plagued with a sin consciousness, thought God was punishing them, constantly God punishing them. The young boy only believed what he would hear. If you think a child don't believe what they hear, oh, you, it would go a long way just by the adults telling the truth. A young boy, little boy, little girl come and sit at the table with their parents and said, I feel like I, I'm a, if it's a boy, I feel like I'm a girl. If the parents would look at him and say, baby, you're not. You're not. You're a little boy. It would settle it. But it's being told a lie. Well, we better find out what all these other people think about you thinking that. But it would go a long way for parents to be parents and just teach them. They believe what you say more than anyone. 
I know of people that were told lies ever, all their life when they were children. They believe it. You can be told that a giant rabbit hops to your house and brings you a chocolate bunny on a certain day and a certain night. And you could do that and, say it and, and teach them that a rabbit lays eggs. You can teach a magical reindeer flying everybody around, bringing gifts, and they'll believe it and fight over it. Well, if you start over a four or five-year-old child and you start telling them, you're really a girl, baby, that child can grow up by the time it's a teenager and be so dysfunctional, they stare at everybody else around them, and it's locked in their minds. They have the body of a man but the mind of a woman. And they get so confused. They don't know what to do. You say, oh, that's awful, Brother Robin. That's just awful stuff, awful stuff. It's the stuff we deal with in this world right now. It's the stuff we deal with. It was like a friend of mine was preaching the other day at the church. And he said, but the answer's in the blood. It's always in the blood. It's in the blood. You either have, uh, you know, X or Y chromosomes. You, you're either man or woman. You can't be. The blood will tell the tale. It don't matter what you else you do. The blood will tell you what you are. And you know what? Here is the thing. And I'm going to say this because Elijah came to two generations. And I know this is, Brother Robin, this, you know, we were, we were looking for something deep. We wanted to know Adam's pet hippo's name. Let me tell you something. This is, this is what, this is where we are. You say, how could we get to the place to where we're having to fight such asinine, ridiculous things? It's not ridiculous to this generation. And there's people above them, my age and so forth, that know what they're doing. Scripture in Romans just said it. And there are churches that give in to support it. Now you just learn the answer. My friend also used this term, trans-spiritual. What is trans-spiritual? It's the, it's the generation Elijah went to. It was the woman who said, have you brought my past sin up to punish me by killing my child? She thought God had killed her child. She thought God was her enemy. The church has taught that God will make you sick, hurt you, break your bones, lay you on your back so you have to look up. It will put you on your knees so you have to, you have to worship. They teach all kinds of things. They teach that God took this one, took this one, picked a pretty little flower and put it in his bouquet on his table in heaven. They, pick, they, they teach all kinds of trash that fits some kind of, horror movie narrative that's trans-spiritual. You can't figure out whether God's doing you good or evil. There was one woman left a meeting, and she said this to the person conducting the meeting. She said, I finally got God figured out. He said, really what? She said, he's half good and half bad. Listening to Christians preach. Think of that. I think it was a, Buddha, a Buddhist said this to a Christian one day. He said, well, at least we know our God ain't for us. He said, you Christians can't figure out whether he's going to kill you or help you. That's trans-spiritual. And it produced enough confusion that transgenderism could be taught to a generation. And the prophet, the prophet came. To settle the issue with the woman, God didn't kill your son because of your past. And to settle the issue with the boy, raise him from the dead. And so prophets are on the scene now stretching themselves on a generation of people. You know, I can't, do, I can't do a whole lot but pray for mercy for people sitting in high political positions with bearded stubble under makeup. I can't do much for them who's wearing a wig then it's obvious what they are, and they know what they are. I can't do much for uh, stupidity and ignorance that sits in front of Congress and says, oh, we can't define what a woman is, and you're supposed to be one. 
but you can't define what one is. I can't do much for that. You can't fix that because that's on purpose. That's on purpose. But this young generation that's been corrupted with such things, they are genuinely confused. And the mind has become a trap. So prophets are on the scene now prophesying, declaring the truth of the word and stretching themselves on a generation of people, eye to eye, mouth to mouth, hand to hand, as Elisha did, to raise a generation from the dead and tell the older generation, God's not your enemy. He's not the one that did this. He's not the one that brought death to your house. And so it started in churches in the spirit realm, and it ended up in the natural. That's the only reason Satan had the power to do what he did. That's all. That's the only reason. So we have to, we have to stand and declare the truth, and that's what makes people so blame mad. They get angry because we dare tell the truth. Well, the truth is being unloosed now in the prophetic generation. This is a prophetic generation. This is why the enemy tries to destroy the prophetic. It is not a pastoral generation, even though they need a pastor. It's not an evangelist generation, even though evangelists are needed. It's not a teacher's generation. It is a prophetic generation. For it is a generation that tells the youth of the day that they have a future and talks about their destiny. And God is raising up prophets in these young people. He's raising up prophets in our generation so that they can go talk about the future. When the truth is bound and a lie reigns, the prophetic must be loosed to speak of destiny, speak of the future. Just like Elijah, it is the time that we stretch ourselves on another generation to raise them from the dead. Hallelujah. And free them from their past. The prophetic mantle does just this. It does more than that, but this is one of the things that fall on the prophetic mantle. We are at the point where we must stretch ourselves upon generation Z with our words, our actions, our, our speech, the truth. We have to stretch ourselves and tell them of their future. If not, it's being rewritten every day. And now Generation Alpha, they're bringing on the scene. They planned on it being a brand new one, something they control. And they've given them a new language. Have you noticed it? They've given them a new language. They talk different. You know, instead of styling, you're dripping now. So forth. They're talking whole new words, whole new language. Why? Because language can be edited. And they're after generation alpha. Z was supposed to do away with all of us. That was the end of the trail. And now alpha comes along. And now they're talking about generation AI. That's absolutely, that could be disturbing. Hallelujah. This is why we have demon-inspired false prophets like Noah Harari and the Hebrew University attacking Jerusalem from the north. The prophets always said they would be attacked from the north. And the prophets and priests hear this in Jerusalem. Let them hear in Israel, you are always being attacked from the north by a demon-speaking corrupted wisdom in Noah Harari. Wake up quick. He's talking about another generation and taking it, going beyond the God of the Hebrew Bible. So even the Hebrew culture is being attacked because you're Hebrew. And your God is being deemed irrelevant. Well, he's not irrelevant. The truth has become unbound to a prophetic generation. And they will declare it. 
They're coming out of the the Baptist churches, the mainline denominations. They are coming. The truth is on the move. The truth is on the move, and the truth will prevail. Hallelujah. And real freedom and real truth comes from the word of the living God, nothing else. Hallelujah. So anyway, that's what I came to tell you today was the truth. I wanted to tell you about the truth. Those of you bound up in militant groups, those of you that are bound up in an LGB, TQ, I don't know what else they've added to it now. Those of you bound up in, in corrupt systems where they've, they've all, always give letters to it. Have you ever noticed it's always letters? and it's, it's so that it can surround you and make a prison. It's trying to rewrite everything. Those of you that are bound up there, I want you to know something. God loves you. Jesus is the truth. And when governments tried to bury it, religions tried to bury it, the government tried to seal it in with their little puny wax seals that only a man could make. When all of this happens and the truth is being uh, told to you as a lie right now, it's being redefined and your very blood defines who you are. Then it has to be in the soul somewhere. No wonder it was told this is the battle for the soul of a nation. In America, it's to change the thinking, change all of the thinking to believe the lie is the truth. Well, it's not. You know, you can say two plus two is six all day, but when it comes to apples and oranges, it's four. Makes no difference. And after a while, when somebody starts trading apples and oranges and they're teaching you that two plus two is six and they end up with more than you, you're going to look at that and say, something's wrong with this. What is wrong here? You've been told a lie. It's still four. So we have to start speaking the truth. We speak the truth in love, but we speak the truth. The answer is right here. Just believe this. Believe this above your feelings. Believe this above what anybody's trying to drill and, and pound into your thinking. Believe the word. Jesus said, thy word is truth. This is the truth. But it's not enough. See, it's not enough for people. So they start saying there's missing books. That's so that you can question the truth. That's all that's about. You know, you take prophets like Joseph Smith and the Mormon church. All prophecy has to be set on the truth. But this book didn't support his prophecies. So another book was written that would. This is how it's done. It has to be written. It is written. It is written. It is written. All prophecy has to be set on written words, the Scripture. Hallelujah. That's why the Scripture says anybody who adds to this book, adds to this book or takes away from it, said the plagues in it will be added to them. So everything changed in 2020. Everything in people's minds changed. The temperature of freedom was taken. Everything changed. And a virus was unleashed by, the, by hell itself. Whatever you want to define it as, that's what it, hell unleashed it. And it corrupted everything. Everything. So the Bible says in the end, said if, if it was possible with their lying wonders, it would even deceive the very elect. You know it's been a terrible thing when a, when a child born one sex can be that sex in their body and be something else in their thinking and has no answers to correct it. So the truth 
will prevail. You can't bury it. They beat on the truth. They beat it till it was even rec not recognizable as a man. They beat him. They tried to kill him. But nobody killed Jesus. He gave his life. He gave it up freely. Until he said it is finished, he wouldn't have died. He would not have died. If he had not said it's finished, he'd have been alive to this day on the earth. But when it was finished, then he gave up his life. They tried to beat it to death. They couldn't. They tried to do everything to it. They couldn't. They tried to beat his mouth shut where he couldn't talk. And still he's yelling with a loud voice from the cross. They tried to drain his blood out of him before he could get there. They tried to dehydrate him. They tried to do all these things to him. And yet he's still crying with a loud voice. Father, forgive them. Forgive them. And then he said in other tongues, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. He prayed the 22nd Psalm in other tongues and finished it by saying it is finished. Then they tried to bury the truth. Well, we couldn't kill it. Now let's bury it. And when they buried the truth, they ran to the government. Give us a seal that we can hold him in. We got to hold the truth down. And then they sealed it. But after three days and nights, the ground started to rumble. And the top soldiers fell like dead men on the ground. They wasn't dead. They fell like dead men. They laid there and didn't move. While that angel, one angel, took that stone and rolled it out of the way. And he came out. You think about that. I imagine as he walked by them on the ground, his feet, they cut their eyes and looked at him. They looked at him, at his feet when he went by. Could see the holes in it. Some of them may have been the ones that put them there. And yet he's coming out. The truth cannot be buried and sealed. Nothing holds it down. Religion can't keep it. Government can't keep it. No one can keep the truth down. It will rise. And the truth is, is that God loves you. Jesus loves you. And he don't like you being bound. And you that are crying for deliverance right now, whether you be in that LGBTQ trapped prison, whether you be in anything else, whether you be bound in drugs and needles, whether you be bound in any other kind of thing that would hold you in bondage and dictate to you, even all the way down to chewing tobacco. If you can't live without tobacco, you say, that's a little bondage. It's still bondage. and He wants you free. Hallelujah. Those of you confused in your mind right now, I want you to put your hand on your head like that. It's symbolic of just of, of this. And I'm going to pray and loose your mind right now. Go ahead. Put your hand on your forehead. If you're out there and you're confused, especially about gender, about anything else, about who God is or anything, put your hand right here. And you, you've been crying for freedom. The Lord has come to answer that today. Are you ready? Listen to this prophet when I speak to you. In the name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I order you, I order you spirit of hell that's confusing them to come out of their minds, get off of their bodies. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus the Christ, who has been given a name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now you turn them loose now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask you to reveal yourself to them. Reveal yourself in a way that it's a fresh breath of life goes through their thinking and through their mind. Lord, we are fighting for a generation of people spiritually to raise them up, Lord God, 
that you can call them into their destinies, that they can come forth, pastors, evangelists, apostles, teachers, prophets, Lord, they can come out and come forth and be in your service, Lord. I ask you to raise up a prophetic generation like the valley of dry bones. We now prophesy over them. You will live. You will live, dry bones. You will live. And some of you feel like you've been bound up. You've dried up. You can't get out. Some of you are backslid preachers, pastors. Some of you are backslid prophets. And you're some of you are in prison right now. You're in real physical prison behind bars and shackles. Right now in the name of Jesus, do what Paul did and begin to lift your hands up and praise God. Ask him to forgive you of what put you there. He will forgive you. And he will begin to make a difference in your life again. And then let him shake things up around you. Let him begin to shake it up. Make it to where uh, the devil would rather have you out of that jail than in it because you're winning so many people to the Lord. Go ahead and say it. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all sin. I failed, but I give it to you now. Make me a success. Those of you that's never been saved say, I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and personal Savior. Come in my heart. Make me new. Make me clean. Give me a new mind. In Jesus' name, take my life. And do something with it. Hallelujah. Now go ahead and get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Say, mighty spirit of God. Mighty spirit of God. This is why the enemy don't want you to, to know the spirit of God. It's because it said when he goes, when, or when he comes, when Jesus said when I go and he comes, he'll reprove the world of sin because they don't know what it is, of righteousness because they don't know what it is, and of judgment because the, the, the enemy of this world has already been judged. So this is why the Holy Ghost is fought so much, because he brings conviction of truth. Not condemnation, conviction of truth. It's when you turn around and say, my God, this is true. So right now say, Lord Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit tells me what to say. And then let him baptize you in the Holy Ghost and start praising him now, praising him and thanking him. And then praise him and, and start speaking in this other language that you hear. Somebody right there when I was speaking in other tongues, praying and praising in other tongues and letting my prayer language go out and all of that, you were laughing and you were mocking. I'll tell you what you do. You do it. Why don't you sit there and do it? I want to, you do it. Go ahead and let it come out of your mouth if it's not real. You know good and well you can't do it. You need to be careful about what you don't know about. And all the the preachers attacking one another. You're part of the problem. You're not giving any deliverance to anyone. You're just part of the problem. When you find yourself agreeing with Wiccans and witches and warlocks uh, that comes against the same ministries you do, you're part of the problem. You don't know the truth. If hell don't like something, that's your clue to like it. Yeah. Dear God, that's transpiritualism. Mm -hmm. Transpiritual. Can't figure out what's right and what's wrong. Hallelujah. Well, okay. So I said all that. And I was led to say it. And I ain't mad at nobody, but I sure do. I can't stand the devil. I don't like him. He takes God's people and twists it up things. He turns the church on each other. He holds people in bondage in the world. Then we let 
goofballs run whole nations around the world. And then the church just looks and say things like this. Well, abortion, you know, uh, there's, there's uh, uh, just because they, this party believes in abortion, that's, you know, that, that, there's other issues. Really? There may be other issues, but abortion is enough to leave them and leave the, their hell alone. Don't side with the dismemberment of unborn children. Yeah, some Republicans believe it too. Well, they're fools. You have to stand for the truth. Let the truth be heard. Speak the truth. Speak it in love. You people in Washington, stand up and get some blame backbone. You claim to know Jesus, and yet you call yourself friends with people who kill the unborn. Really? If you slaughter the unborn, I can't hang out with you. I couldn't hang out with you. Don't say people that slaughter the unborn are good people. They may be confused people. But some are not. I'm going to tell you something. In these last days we live in, you know, people attack over things we say, things in the spirit. You know, the apostle Paul said, I knew a man above 14 years ago, whether he was in his body or out of his body, he said, I don't know. God knows. It was that real to Paul. He said, but he was caught up to the third heaven and spoke of things that are unlawful to speak. They're not in the law. He heard words of grace. He heard words of, of grace that was that he never saw in the law. But you know, today people would attack him and say, do you know that apostle Paul said he went to heaven? But yet he's in the scripture. And God sealed that and gave his authorization on that story. And so I talk about visions and things that I've seen other men and women of God do, and they get attacked for it. It's like the one guy in the, the Assembly of God years ago. I'll never forget this. And I remember this story from years back. And the man in the Assembly of God, he, they were bringing him up on, well, not charges, but religious interrogation. And they called the elders together, and they said, we are here to talk about brother so-and-so who saw an angel. It's a full gospel church. I think it was assembly of God it said, saw an angel. And they said, we don't know what to do about this. We need to discuss this. So they turned to a man in his nineties and said, let's ask brother so-and-so. He's been in this way all these years. He's been in the way all these years. And the older man stood up and he said, it does not bother me that brother so-and-so said he saw an angel. He said, what bothers me is that we're not all seeing them. So we've taken the supernatural out of churches and out of our belief. And we're mocked for seeing spiritual things. As, just as Noah was mocked for building a boat for rain they didn't see yet. In a flood they didn't think was coming. So spiritual people begin to see spiritual visions and talk about supernatural events because you can't take that experience from them. They saw it, they saw it, and you can't say, you, you can say they didn't, but you wasn't there. And a man with an experience beats a man with head knowledge every time. Every time. You don't remember what it was like to be born either. You don't remember that. You don't remember when that seed collided with that egg and that spark of lightning hit and begin it dividing the way it does. You don't remember that. 
but you'd be real foolish to stand up and say it don't happen because the very mouth that says it don't happen, it happened to them. That's kind of foolish. I remember years ago, I'll never forget this. It's vivid in my mind as it was then. You know, usually when the Lord speaks to me, <clears throat> now he just speaks to me in a prophetic utterance, and I'll give the word. And, it, and you know, when you see it come to pass, people ooh and ah, but it wasn't my word that did it. It wasn't my word that it originated, I should say. It came from him. But I remember a dream I had. And dreams, dreams can be so vivid. And you can tell when God sent you that dream. I wish we had time to teach a little bit on dreams. But here is the thing. In this dream, I was suddenly in a desert place. And I, I didn't realize, but I saw that desert place. It was almost identical to those I saw in Israel not long ago, down in different places toward the Dead Sea and all that. And I saw this in this desert place. And I came walking up. And I remember the wind was blowing, and it was hot. It was a hot wind. And I remember it blowing my hair. This is how real this was. And I heard this eagle screech over my head. It was way up high. I could see the mesa, the flat top mountains out in the distance. This big, long mesa. And I, I heard this eagle scream. And I remember there was a pennant on a pole in the ground leaning. It was green, and it, and it was like a, a sports pennant shape. It was shaped like that. It was blowing. It would do like this as the wind would hit it. And my eyes went down, and the only thing I could hear was a, kind of the wind, the eagle, and my eyes went down to look at the ground. And as far as I could see, there were bodies laying face down. They were laying down, and they, were, they looked like warriors. And the only way I know to describe them is, is they didn't look like modern soldiers with, with armor and helmets and, and anything like that. They looked like warriors that would have favored something like Conan the Barbarian or something like that. Conan, we say in the South. And it was kind of like that. They had like a skirt that went down below their knee. They were very muscular built, long black hair that came to their belt. It was so black, I remember it was shiny. And they were laying down, face down. And I could see the one closest to me that my eyes could really focus on. His hand was laying like this, and his sword was laying out of his hand on the ground where he fell and, and died and dropped it. And I'm looking across this whole vast place, and they were, they were just like that everywhere, everywhere, as far as I could see. They were all identical. They looked just alike. And then I could feel the wind, and I could see the pennant, and I could hear that eagle. And then all at once, I knew I was looking at, at dead. They were all dead, and it was silent, all but those sounds. A bad battle had taken place, and I could see their black, shiny hair blowing. He'd just pick up a strand or two and drop it. And then all at once, one close to that pennant was laying face down. And then his hand did like this. And his other hand went up and he began to push himself up off the ground. His long hair strung, hung down like that to the ground. And he started pushing himself up. And when he, when he started to stand on his feet, he gripped his sword. And he stood up, and I can see him doing like this, and he was wobbling. He was just staggering like that. But he had his sword in his hand. And then he finally started standing up. And then about a 100 bodies over from him, another one did the same. And then they started standing up all over the vast ground. And I believe that's the prophetic generation of today. That it's in the time of the eagle. It's in the time of covenant. It's in the time 
when, when there's been a fierce battle over the truth and a fierce battle has slain the warriors of God in the spirit and they're just laying everywhere across the ground but you can't hold down the truth and you can't hold down things. You can't hold down the, when, the, when the breath of God starts blowing across the land. And they started standing up and I believe that's this generation. At least it pertains to it. That's this generation that has died and prophets are on the scene to prophesy, to prophesy. And I believe it has to do with a lot of things. I think it has to do with Israel. I think it has to do with Islam even. I think it has to do with America. I think it has to do with the church. I think it has to do with everything of battle between good and evil. And I saw that. And that army stood back up on his feet like an Ezekiel and was ready to fight again. And we're talking about a spiritual thing happening now. Prophecy and prophets tell of things that sound strange to a world. And a world takes it literal and attacks back with the literal sense of something. They don't have any understanding of spiritual events. They have no understanding of the world between the spirit and the natural and how it even comes together. They just get scared of the truth because it has been resurrected. So the truth scares people. It scares them. Years ago, I was back when we had pay phones. Some of you will remember pay phones. Young children and young people probably don't remember pay phones. But some of you do. I remember phone booths that you went in and shut the door. Then I remember when it graduated to something sitting on a pole, just a little short something. It was a dime. It was a nickel, dime, then, you know, a dime to make a call. Then it's a quarter. Songs were written. I drop a dime in the pay phone and so forth. And a dime in the jukebox. I remember when a Coca-Cola was a dime. And so then you, I saw this, I was standing at a, a little fast food, seafood restaurant, and I'm over there on the phone like this, and I'm talking to somebody early in ministry, and I'm talking to them about reaching the, uh, the youth and different things like that. And this cold wind blew across my neck, and I turned around and looked down the street, and up in the sky, just like I'm looking at these cameras in this screen and it was this big clock and it looked like this clock behind me it was this big clock hanging in the sky and it said I wanted to say it said 15 minutes till 12 something like that and I looked at it and I'm just taken I could hear somebody on the phone talking because, you know, the phones had a tail then. And I, I'm, I could hear them, but, man, I'm looking at the clock. That's the reason this clock is back here. And I'm looking at the clock. And then my eyes, it was over a big, huge, there was a big church down there, but it was up in the sky, big. And then I looked down at the wall, just dropped my eyes down and against the seafood restaurant, the wall there was these soldiers in, in dark armor and silver armor. And the soldiers in the silver type armor was, they looked like that, they had a cape kind of and a, and a helmet and they were walking one direction. And then on the other side, there was people in dark armor walking the opposite direction. Then up the middle between the two armies was street everyday people. And, man, I'm staring at all this. And then suddenly I remembered I'm on the phone, and I turned my head like this and said something, and when I, I looked back quickly, and it was all, of course, gone. And I asked the Lord, I said, what did I see? He said, those in silver armor are the people that know me, and they know they're in a spiritual war, and they're fighting on purpose. He said, those in the dark armor you saw are people that are not deceived, they know exactly what they're doing, and they're fighting against me. 
He said, and those in the middle are the everyday people that don't even know a war is going on around them. And he said, the clock in the sky is how many minutes you have left. That's how much you have left to, to do, to fight. Spiritually fight for a whole generation like that. And so I never forgot that. I never forgot that. And I believe that this is that time. This is that time. And if I could tell you the series of the clock, it went from 15 to 7 minutes till till 2 minutes till. Maybe sometime I can talk about that. And it was that 2 minutes till. Two, 2 minutes, I believe, was 2 minutes of silence doing a political thing one day. But it's, it's 2 minutes till. You know, and if you, you look at our clock back here, that's about the time. And so we're in this time, this generation. And I want to prophesy over a generation. Stand up. Start lifting yourself up. And we have to show all these people that we're not full of hate. We're not full of malice. And we're not full of strife. We are full of the anger of God, which is the delivering power of God. When God is angry, it means he has a driving passion to deliver someone. And so we're looking to deliver them. We want our children to have a future. We want your children to have a future. We want destiny to be realized. We want dreams to happen. We want people to live out their dreams the way God has called them to. Well, the truth has been hidden, so forth, but the truth is being unbound now. The stone is rolled away, so there's no way to keep it down. And so we're walking in the truth. We're calling a generation forth with the truth. And so here's where we stand now with the truth. Hallelujah. So start telling people that about it. Start talking to them about it. Talk to them about their destiny. Talk to them about their identity. Call their name out. Ask them what is their name. See what answers, the spirit or them. What is your name? Well, he's talking to the spirit. Well, maybe, but was he? Well, he could be talking to the man. Ask what is your name and see who answers. That's the key. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the truth, and thank you, Lord, for the song of the truth, the tune of the truth, and thank you for the 11th hour partners who are not afraid of the truth. Hallelujah. Pray for us, partners. I pray for you every day. Pray for us because the enemy, uh, is, he tries to attack us so heavy, and he tries to, to cause all kinds of things in the ministry. But you pray for us, and God will bring deliverance. Like Paul said, he said, I'll be delivered by your prayer. And if you start praying, then the truth that we're telling will go further and further and further. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, all right. We've led people to the Lord. We've, we've, got a, we've, we've told them about how to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now I want Krista to come and teach us how to prosper. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Well, we want to give you an opportunity to sow today. If you would like to do that, you can go to robindbullock.com. The ways to give will be on the screen, and you can also find all of that information there. You know, that that is the truth. Everything he said was the truth. The word is true, and it will be standing true. It's the only thing in existence that will be standing when everything else fails. When everything else falls, the, the word of God will stand the test of time. It will absolutely stand the test of time and will be standing the day that time is no more. And it'll still be there. And everything, you'll look back at it all one day. Read the entire scripture and say, every single thing came to pass. Every single thing was true. And you know, it's the truth that you know. The Bible says, and you shall know the truth. Shall. The strongest word in the English language. That means there's no maybe about it. There's no brief moment of maybe that won't happen or maybe that will happen. There's no gray area in shall. Shall is one of those black and white words. There's no middle ground. It sh you shall know the truth. So one day's coming 
that you shall know the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But it's the truth that you know. You got to know the truth. And to know the truth, you got to get in the Word. Because the, there's no gray area in the Word of God. It is true. And so the Scripture says, you know, he was talking about praying for us. There is, there is a prayer that will, that will stand, be standing when time is no more. And it can apply to you spiritually, physically, and financially. And it's the prayer that Jesus said when this is how you pray in Matthew. He said, our Father who art in heaven. That means you're, you're going, you're acknowledging the fact that your Father is in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy, holy be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I'm going to stop right there. You know, every, that, this whole prayer can apply to everything. We, I feel like we say this prayer as a, just as a blanket prayer, like just a blanket statement. You know, it's just not, we, we've lost the depth in what we call the Lord's Prayer. And I feel like the enemy has tried to hide the truth of that prayer just by making it just something you say, just something that you throw around or whatever, or that you learn in elementary school if, you know, if you're in private school and, and you pray over your food or something like that. And it becomes the enemy has got us believing that the Lord's prayer is not powerful. Well, that goes to show you that if the enemy is doing that, then there is about a 150% chance that it's the most powerful prayer in existence. How do I know that? Because Jesus said, this is how you pray. Let me show you how to pray. It says, on, on earth as it is in heaven. There's no death in heaven. There's no sickness in heaven. There's no poverty in heaven. There's no lack in heaven. There's no death. There's no darkness in heaven. And he says, on earth as it is in heaven. Then he says, give us this day our daily bread. Now that's food spiritually and physically. That is your, give us this day our daily bread would be your substance here. So that's spiritually, physically, and financially. That's your substance. Because bread is a substantial food. And it will fill you up faster than anything. That's why when you go to a restaurant, you eat the bread that they they give you before your food. And then by the time your food gets there, you're not even hungry because you done picked out on the bread. I'm not, I mean, I ain't going to lie, that bread's good, too, some places. That's why you can eat this much of pasta, like a whole grain pasta or something like that, you'll be full instantly. Bread is substantial, and it fills you up. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, see, there's, this isn't the only part in the Scripture where he says, when you pray, stand forgiving so that your Father in heaven can forgive you. So give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, our sins, spiritually, physically. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Well, he don't tempt, test, or try anybody. Let no man say that. So he's not, he's not going to lead you that way. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now that's a request you're making known to God. Deliver us from evil. So what, whatever evil is coming against you right now, 
spiritually, physically, financially, whatever, in all, in all three, whatever evil is coming against you in your life, Jesus himself said to pray this, deliver us from evil. Lord, deliver us right now from evil. Deliver us from evil. Deliver our 11th hour partners from evil. Then, then he, he starts off acknowledging and praising God. And then he ends the prayer by acknowledging and praising God. Deliver us from evil. And then it says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen, so be it. Now, if Jesus tells you to pray that way, you probably need to start praying that way. And don't just use it. Our Father who art in heaven, I would be thy name. I mean, I'm, taking, I'm saying take that prayer step by step. So, uh, John, I, I want you to put that on the screen. It's in Matthew. And we're going to pray this together over every part of our life. We're going to pray this. Let's see, Matthew, I had it pulled up right here. It's Matthew 6, 9 through 13. And we're going to pray this together as a family. So it says, after this manner, therefore pray ye. So this is how you pray. Here we go. I'm, we're going to say it together. Powerful. Not just, you know, you thought you said this as a group in school or at your Sunday school and, and all that. But we're going to say it now as mature, grown-up believers who believe what Jesus said. And what Jesus said is true because you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So here it is. We say it together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed, holy be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen, so be it. Hallelujah. Well, I call that done in our lives today in Jesus' name. And that's what the Lord had me to tell you is to remind you of how to pray when you pray regarding any matter of your life. Praise God. I don't know about you, but that excited me because that's freedom. That is freedom right there from what the enemy has placed on you and tried to attack you with today. Praise God. Well, once again, I want to pray over, over your giving today out of Luke 6.38. And I want to pray that as you give, it is given back to you. It is given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You say, I believe it, I receive it, and I call it done in Jesus' name. Now, if you're a tither, Malachi 3. 10 says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in thine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all 
all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. You say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done in Jesus' name. Amen. So be it. Well, I wanted to make this announcement. If you are, uh, are around uh, South Dakota, if you're around Eagle Butte, South Dakota, June 23rd and 24th, that's a Friday night and a Saturday night, the 11th hour team will be in Eagle Butte, South Dakota. And so I will be putting that um, out on the social sites here um, within the next day. And so you can have all the information. It's totally free, no registration required. It is actually on um, the Sioux Reservation. And so we are just so thrilled. We've never been to that area before. And so I am looking forward to seeing what God is going to do. Remember, that's June 23rd and 24th of 2023. So in case you come across this like three years down the road, this is, this is the time and that is where we will be. So we hope to see some of you there. Some of our 11th hour partners, I know it is going to be an amazing time. So I just wanted to invite you, come out, be with us, and let's see what God's going to do. Amen. Amen. Roxanne, do we have any praise reports today? Yes, yes, we do. We have, I have page upon page upon page. So some of these I'll read next week as well because we had quite a few that came in uh, by phone this week, uh, this past week. So I just wanted to read some so that we could step on the devil's head and rejoice with you today for what God's doing in your life. Um, this one says, uh, please be encouraged you're reaching heaven's hotline. I requested prayer for swollen feet and ankles on May 17th, in which the affliction started months ago. I tried all types of things, but within two days of your prayers, my feet and ankles are totally normal. Concern and worry have left me, and I've lost six pounds this week. I'll continue to pray and be disciplined regarding my health, and I love my wonderful Lord Jesus. Thank you for your ministry. So praise the Lord. This one says, I sent an offering two or three weeks ago. I requested a prayer for rain in our area. It had been almost two and a half years with very little rain. We got almost three inches of rain this last week. Thank you for praying. My cattle, goats, and chickens and I are praising the Lord. So hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for the rain. Let's see. Um, this one This one right here I wanted to read to you guys. It says, uh, praise the Lord. So many people have been praying for my son. He was an addict and uh, using fentanyl and anything else he could get his hands on. Finally, he was arrested and got a year in jail. So she says that she thought there was other programs that he would be able to be ministered through and things like that, but he did end up going to jail. But she said the Lord told her he was going to teach him, and she said, teach him he has. She said, I don't know where my old son went, but I'm so blessed with the new one that I have. He called and was laughing, saying, I have three Bibles open on my bed. I haven't heard him laugh in years, and I can't send him enough things to read. He wants all that I can get to him. He wants to go to the OTTBC Bible College there in January and hopes to visit Warrior one day. She said, this mama's heart is so full. Thank you, uh, Jesus, for what he's done. So praise the Lord. That's amazing. Hallelujah. This one said, I wanted to reach out and share uh, with the partners of the 11th hour. This is someone, and I'll just paraphrase this because this one's kind of lengthy, said that they had been on prescription drugs, um, other kinds of drugs, other the other things they had been involved in um, for years and years. They said it was a heavy burden that they saw no end to. They said, I started paying attention to the 11th hour services around the time of Rosh Hashanah in 2022. And each week um, I would repeat prayers with you and I repeated the salvation prayer as well. It was encouraging to hear you preach that the Lord would take me as I am. So I started tuning in to CI live streams in December, became a tither in January, and a month later I was taking steps to get my life back. Each little thing I was bound in I started committing to letting go of. And as soon as I was off uh, prescription medication, I was able to quit everything else in no more than two months, and I was clean and living a sober life. 
and I just wanted a deeper relationship with God. I could not have done any of that without Jesus in my life, and I wanted to give thanks for the work you guys are doing. It has made a huge difference in my life. So glory to God, and God bless you all. So praise the Lord. Thank you, Father, that addicts are being set free. People are being healed. Families are being restored. Prodigals are coming home, and that God is working all around this world. And thank you so much for sending your praise report so that we can rejoice with you. Continue to do that. Call into our office. Let us know what God's done for you so that we can rejoice and we can put another bump on the enemy's head. <laughs> Amen. So hallelujah. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Man, that was exciting praise reports. Amen. And we're about to add new classes to uh, OTTBC. About to do, I'm going to do some new prophetic classes to add to the others. You know, people look at that and they may say, well, Brother Robin, you look a lot different in them old uh, school videos. You know, I know it. And I, I started to, I, was, I even took my own notes, listened to my own uh, teaching, and was taking my own notes. And I thought, well, I'll teach it again so that it don't look so old. And then when I started to try to do it, I couldn't reproduce the anointing that was on it. The anointing that was on the original was so strong, I couldn't make that, I couldn't get into that again. So I said, I'm just going to put it out there like it is. And so uh, people have said before, they said, man, that, that was the, the revelation and the teaching that was in those classes. I know it. That's why I just left them like they were. And now I'm going to add some new prophetic classes to them and uh, for some new things. So it's going, to be, it's going to be pretty awesome. You know, I was thinking about what Krista said in Matthew 6 and 13 in the Lord's Prayer. said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And one of the words for that word temptation there is try, try. So it's, it's the same word you said as in the book of James. You just confirmed that for me. Same Greek word. So if you lead us not into temptation, tempt, test, or try. If you lead us not into that, to that, he said, pray this, but deliver us from evil. So think about it. Think about this then. When you're tempted, tested, or tried, then it's evil. And he's, <laughs> you, he said, you pray I, that you're delivered from that. Instead of embracing it, oh, I'm being tested and tried. No, he said, you need to pray you're delivered from that. Don't, because he called that evil. So anyway, I thought that was awesome. I heard that when you said it, and I thought, hmm, that right there just goes right in with the absolute goodness of God, doesn't it? Amen. You know, that brings me to this. If you're watching today and you don't have that book, God is absolutely good. I very seldomly ever talk about products that I have or anything like that. But I really believe that that's the revelation uh, that is, is going to be the, the bridge of the sword and the spirit, the sword of the spirit coming together. I believe that message is one that brings the two together immediately. And uh, so if you just go to my website, robindbullock.com, and look at the product page, and you'll see a book called God Is Absolutely Good. You hear us say it all the time, but I want you to, I want you to get the book and have it, and it's just any donation you want to make will get it. So just go there, and um, if, if you say, well, I can't afford that, I, I think it will accept an offering of any size, so just get it. And uh, if not, you write to me. We'll see to it you get it. But I want you to have it, and I want you to study that book and, and let God talk to you. Go listen to the Church International live stream from Sunday morning. What date was this past Sunday? So in case it's three years down the road here. June the 4th, 2023. Go look at that. Um, I didn't really know I was going to teach that morning, and then suddenly I was teaching. And I taught on the absolute goodness of God. If you'll get that message and that book and put them together, you've really got something then. And uh, I want you to hear it. That, that service, they said I preached three hours. I didn't know that. So maybe, you know, but nobody got up and left. That I, nobody really moved around. A few left, but, you know. But I know this. If you'll go listen to it, it'll change your life forever. 
Now, I want you to know that Church International, the 11th hour, uh, the, the Church International prayer stream all together. And so tonight there will be a, a Tuesday night international prayer outreach. And if you're around Church International, there will be live prayer there at, the, at the, the real synagogue, at the real church tonight. And then there will be prayer on the cyber synagogue, which is um, our international uh, prayer ministers. So you want to visit that. Now, that's on the churchint.org. You can go there and watch it, and it'll also be on YouTube tonight on the Church International YouTube channel. So if you need prayer, things are going on, chat into that prayer uh, tonight at 7 p.m. Central Time, and let your prayer requests be known, and they will be praying over you tonight, praying over nations. This reaches nations. Hallelujah. And I'll be praying over our partners tonight also. So, well, I guess that's it for today, huh? Uh, we've probably stirred up a hornet's nest of devils, so we'll just, we'll just see where they swarm now. Amen. Well, until next time, we gather together right here around God's Word. I want you to remember, never forget that God is absolutely good. Shalom, shalom.